I'm a senior lecturer at uh, Manchester Met University. I teach in what is now our Department of Apparel. So I'm being filmed about a watch what I say, I suppose. Um, but um, and most of what I teach is around sort of pattern cutting and human measurement and product development. So I'll give you some sort of reflections on my experience and focus that around body scanning itself. Hopefully, there'll be some interesting bits within it. With any luck, it'll be coherent. Okay, so body scanning for fashion design, I suppose, is how we're seen to use it. But really, I would sort of categorise it as body scanning for product development as a means to start the, uh, the development process. I'm going to start with current limitations. Many of you might be aware of them. The biggest limitation of body scanning as it currently stands is posture, i.e. you get somebody in one single posture in one single instance and that's all you have. You can't change the posture. I've put at the bottom there, scanner does not produce parametric models. All right. And one of the other things that's going to come out of this, again, is body scanning as a technology hasn't necessarily been devi devised and developed by clothing manufacturers. It might have been developed alongside clothing manufacturers, but believe me, there's a variety of different skill sets brought to bear on this. And computer scientists don't generally make clothes. And they don't generally have an appreciation of it. And therefore, the things the technology does doesn't always satisfy the requirements of the end user. Most of what I'll talk about is related specifically to the TC squared scanning technology, which is what we've been using. It's probably the most advanced technology for clothing in terms of body scanning. It's specifically developed for that. So to back again, current limitations being the posture. You've one fixed instance of one person captured over a small time frame, and you can't modify that posture. But the greatest benefit of that is you have that snapshot, that 3D photograph, let's say, of that person, you can analyse again and again. So very often you manually measure someone, you go, do you know what, it'd be very useful to have that measurement. You can't get it unless you bring them back. With a scanner, accepting the fact that I can't move their arms and their legs from the posture they're in, I can analyse them whatever way I want, as many different ways as I want within the limitations of the software or other software that's developed. So we have that capacity for a snapshot. And again, it brings a real interesting discourse that will happen. So I've been scanned 20 years' time, 30 years' time, when my son has been scanned. He won't have any choice about it. But once I've scanned him a few times, he'll have that opportunity to make that comparison. And that's something we've never historically had. And again, that changes the dynamic of how we understand people in the design process. Um, another limitation, manual techniques. Okay, Bench, Body scanning is benchmarked against manual techniques of measurement, but they are not at all the same technology. I spoke to someone just the other week who said, we manually measured our students and we stuck them through the body scanner and there weren't comparable measurements. Of course they weren't. They're not designed to be necessarily comparable measurements. They're different ways of capturing different information. And there is a difficulty because manual measurements are used as a benchmark for them and you see that within the ergonomic um, national standards and the people are falling back on that without necessarily realising this technology actually gives an opportunity for a completely different perspective on the body. Skills development, that's probably one of the most difficult things, okay? My background is pattern cutting, then that naturally leads into human measurement. It doesn't naturally lead into body scanning and then dealing with the body as a 3D entity. You know, you learn the skills you need to learn for the application you have. And I'm at the point now where suddenly I've got to deal with this 3D avatar of the body in an electronic environment and understand the systems and the software and the applications for using it and they don't translate easily. To give you an example, this is me last night trying to clean the neck points on the back of this body scan and then I re-imported it back into the software and realised that I just obliterated all the hip area. So, you know, the technology <laughs> doesn't necessarily do what I want it to do. There's a real need, again, using this technology for interdisciplinary working. It's never going to go forward if you don't have it. Obviously, long term, I'll probably learn how to use this and clean my scans effectively, but it would be much easier to work within a team of people that have that understanding. <coughs> Again, we talked about, uh, well, I talked about skills development. All right, the, the system that I have is, um, uses automated location of physical landmarks on the body. They don't always work. They don't always position themselves where they should be. Again, it's another skill set. So my PhD was looking at functional change. Within that, I was looking at physical surface change of the body. It was necessary to locate manual landmarks. Now, 
you know, from a pattern cutting perspective, I knew how to measure people, at least I thought I did. And then you go down the route of working out how you measure people, and then you realise that there are better ways of measuring people. ISAK has probably got a very comprehensive method, for, well, it definitely has a very comprehensive method for measuring people with clear identification of landmark met location methods. But believe me, if you want to learn to locate landmarks on the physical body in real space on actual people, it's very difficult to get that information outside of practice. And you learn that, and then you move into this electronic environment, and suddenly you're having to locate 3D places on a con this geometric structure and try and work out from some understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the body where that point should be in that 3D space compared to where it's positioned. So it's positioned here, and it probably should be about there. And to move that point, I've got to take this scan, rotate it through a number of degrees, turn on certain measurements, and move that point in 3D space to a position where I think it's going to be most appropriate for it to be. Obviously, there's issues or potential discussions around accuracy, but actually they throw up a whole area of, of um, different communication. I'm happy to talk to people about it, but you know, I defend the necessity to say this is an inaccurate tool I mean, for the application and anyway it's a discussion that probably takes too long to go into now so I'll leave it at that but there's this need to learn a new skill and interpret data in a different way and I would categorically state you can't do this without an appreciation you can't move into a 3d environment and look at adjusting measurements on the body in that environment without an appreciation of actual measurement and the physiology and some experience of physically measuring people. Measurement definitions. Um, within the software, as I say, it's sort of automated. I'm not going to sell you the software. It's what we've got. It's what we use. But it has its limitations as do other pieces of software. But we can extract all sorts of different measurements. Um, and I talked about benchmarking and the difficulty. This is a sort of an indication of some of the variants that might exist there. And I've got a quote later on, and hopefully I'll come to it, that will put this in a firmer context for you. But these are the definitions of the software itself for how it takes those particular measurements. And the best thing is, this is a standard for international design. No hip definition. Fantastic. So the hip measurement doesn't matter, yet we know bust weight and hip are the most important sizing criteria or method of communicating sizing in our society. I'm not saying they're necessarily the best method, but I mean hip is probably the most stable of the three measurements and it's not there as a definition. So you've already got that disconnect between ergonomics and what I would specify as clothing anthropometrics. And you can see there's a variation there. And when we move into the scanner, smaller back, I mean I'm not entirely sure still what that is, but you can find different information on it. But it's a way of categorising a position in 3D space that's very different from how you might determine the waste manually. Okay, so importantly with the scanner, it allows for, and this is any scanning technology, but it allows for an opportunity to think clearly about context. I've got a quote at the end, it probably would have been better to go at the start, but what we can start to do with the body scanner and scanning technology is look at how we extract measurements and then get a clear context, a clear indication of what their context is. So you can see this relates to a recent project, everything on the left-hand side, where we scanned a load of people in Nottingham for uh, an industrial company or an industry company, and um, I made sure that every measurement that we took had a clear context in it, a, a clear application in the pattern itself. So you can see they're numbered on the representative pattern and that gives a clear indication of where their context is. And I'll just give you an indication of why that's important. Bust level just here, you can see where that fits. But when that pattern was created, that physical bust measurement was used to determine the underarm point. So this blue line here, this underarm level, that bust measurement was taken. It had an addition of an ease of ease to it for whatever people want to say ease is there for. And that is where it defined the size and the dimensions of that 2D shape. But the actual context of that bust measurement in the pattern is much lower than where it's applied. And therefore, there isn't a linearity between the physical measurement you'll take and then the measurement of the garment. So the person and the garment don't correspond in the way that people often believe that they do. And you can, the amount of people that make a comparison between a 
armpit measurement of a garment and a bust measurement of a person, believing that they are in any way comparable and they don't fall on the same level. It misinforms the design process and misassures people that they have control over something when actually they don't. So the body scanner allows us to start to extract different information and relate it clearly to its context in, of its application. And then on the right hand side, measurement networks. And it's a really important consideration within clothing. Everyone talks about 1D measurements, well let's say, and then the capacity to take other things. But if we just stick with one dimensional measurements like circumferences and lengths, the important thing is when you deal with them historically, and there's a tendency to do that, they deal with them as completely separate measurements. But this idea of a measurement network means that every measurement relates to another measurement. So I'd say, you know, the seventh cervical is probably, or cervical, however I want to pronounce it, is probably the most stable point on the body in terms of repeatably locatable. If you use that and can relate every other measurement to it, you can put it clearly into the context. You're taking something from this 3D XYZ structure into this 2D XY structure. And whilst we have clothing produced and tied to a 2D environment, you need to retain that link. Um, I've probably got something else which specifies it a little clearer, but this is the bust, waist and hip here. Oh no, it isn't. Well, it's, it's the bust, the underbust and the waist. All right, and you'd see that, but let's take bust and waist as a clear example. You'll find those communicated as sizing dimensions on plenty of garments, but the depth between the bust and the waist is rarely stated, okay? And, but that clearly is the relationship that this pattern has to this person. And if you don't specify it, what do you fall back on? So I had a conversation with someone the other week and we talked about specifying measurements for industry. And I said, we're taking the waist from this and the hip um, from this um, data for a company. So guess where the definitions are? It's the hip, 20 centimetres down from the waist. And it's that standardisation of approach because the data isn't taken and isn't there that again provides misinformation because the hip is not always 20 centimetres down from the waist but it's a necessary shorthand almost for the industry to make up for the difficulties of not necessarily having the right information and not always having enough information. So you know moving into this context of measurement networks where no measurement exists in isolation every measurement has a clear dimensional relationship to the others you can then move from this 3D structure to this 2D structure and back again with much more control in hopefully a more linear format. The role of ease in the block. So I talked about ease. I've not put the slide in, I think, which gives what I suggest um, defines ease. But if you want to think again about product development and potential prod problems that people face, you can take physical measurements of the body, okay? And we do that, and this is... Aldrich's basic pattern constructed to fit a size 12 mannequin and that's Armstrong's size 12 pattern constructed to fit the same mannequin and that's Beasley and Bonds constructed to fit the same mannequin. Brays, Campbell's, Bunker, Hagar, Kunick, Chauvin and Ward. So that is all of these different patterns produced by you know, some of the major global methods for standardising the creation of this pattern block and the only variance within those pattern blocks is the ease that each of them in actually applies to it. But none of them are categoric about that offset between the physical measurement of the body and the physical measurement of the garment. And therefore, you get in touch with someone and say, I want you to make me a bodice block, and you don't specify which method. Well, if they made you Aldrich's pattern block, and then you sent it somewhere else, and they made you Bunker's pattern block, and even if they made the same adjustments to it, you're not going to get the same garment at the end of it. So there are lots of opportunities for that disconnect to be there. And again, rolling that back to things like measurement networks and body scanning, you have the opportunity to create that linearity and a clearer understanding of the dimensional nature in terms of physical measurements of the body and how that might influence um, or how that might impact on problems in the design process. All right, some of the other things you can do with scanning technology, low-tech virtual fit. So there's all this talk about high-tech fit and we can do virtual catwalks and virtually try garments on. But if you imagine that the garment sets the dynamic for the fit of characteristics of that person, if you take measurements of that garment and propose how it's going to fit a person, so let's take a pair of jeans, and we did this for a pair of jeans from a UK 
retailer and we took the crotch depth and we said, well, look, let's imagine that fits to the crotch of this person. Let's take the depths from that and we'll use this, this garment to determine where the measurement's going to be taken from the body. And that way we can make a quick comparison between how this garment might fit them by dint of the fact the difference between the physical measurements of the garment and the physical measurements of the person. And you can run this very easily on the system to get an idea of, will that garment actually go on that person? So there's a good opportunity to utilise this technology in a way to in predict potential fit issues. And it's something we'll further explore. And then the other thing is this idea of head theories. I mentioned somebody else before, there's a really interesting article in the International Journal of Clothes and Science and Technology from possibly the end of last year about scanning and 3D design. But in that, they've got a completely unreferenced chapter and they talk about eight head theory and Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. And they imply that the body adheres to this proportionality in a population as if everybody has, you know, eight head theory has been proven that it exists and you know you can divide it and when you look historically through even the tailoring guides you can see this influence of eight head theory and that's probably a lot of the, what influences this idea that waist to hip measurements are statically 20 centimeters in a population so we can utilize this technology to challenge that idea of eight head theory and maybe propose something better but I mean, it's a very interesting concept and there's great opportunities to understand the body in a completely different way. So, another thing that we've done with the scanner, um, that first one there, this first scan, that's a size 12 fit model for um, a UK company. And the other nine people, okay, we scanned 240 people in a small project in Nottingham in July. And we took those people, and then I said, right, if this company, and I know the company um, specify what they say on their website in terms of bust, waste and hip is what they say to their suppliers because I've seen that information and therefore I know that there's a consistency there and I can take the physical dimensions that they say they make to your bust, waste and hip dimensions for that size and understand if we accept that sizing theory works on the principle that a garment will fit you if you are the size it's made to fit plus or minus half the integer up and down to the next size. That gives you a range of fit that we're expecting. And then I take these people and we say, right, hip's probably the most stable measurement. So I looked at it and said, how many people match the size 12 um, hip? And we had about 50. So fine, that's my 50 people that match this size 12 hip for this particular retailer. And then we narrowed it further by waist and said, well, how many people fit the waist as well, both the hip and the waist for this retailer? And we got down to about sort of 25, 30. So how many people hit bust, waist, and hip for this particular retailer? And we got nine. Okay, so that's nine people that are that size 12 from that particular retailer. Now, there's no specificity with age. I haven't categorised them all by age. There's clearly a variety of different ages in here, from 18 to however old they happen to be, these particular scan subjects. But... You know, the retailer itself doesn't say you must be this age to shop there. There isn't, you know, some sort of bracketed age category. We make that decision. So you can't say, you know, until a retailer says we make for this age category, you can't then narrow down by age category in that way. But you can clearly see these people are hugely varied. Their bust, waist and hip occur all on the different level. And if you take the fit model as the barometer, as in you know, the benchmark for all these people's fit, you can clearly see that their posture and proportions vary hugely. But one of the key things about body scanning is it's a great tool for us to start to engage in this type of conversation. This is a very simple way of representing the figure to you, demarking bust, waist and hip. But with more time, there's better ways of informing people about the variety and the difference of body shape within a population. And uh, I read a paper published in 2000, really interesting premise it's based on saying um, that with this global population and with um, greater sort of, well, integration of different ethnicities, there'll be this sort of narrowing of categories and we'll end up with this sort of homogenous human race that are all the same size and shape. Uh, and then you read it and you think about it a little bit and actually that's never going to happen because 
what's going to happen is you're going to have this explosion. Two people don't reproduce a third person that is a, a sort of distillation of those two people. They produce a third person that's another variable. The human race isn't getting infinitely narrower in its categories. It has the potential to get infinitely broader. So this idea of standardisation of people is quite anomalous to what is actually going to happen, where you're just going to have more and more variation. Although I'm quite happy for someone to correct me on that and tell me that I'm completely wrong and genetically will end up along these same lines, this very narrow category, but I'm not convinced. And therefore, it sort of flies in the face of this idea of standardisation. What else does it push us towards? It moves us into different ways of conceiving the body. So I go back to that earlier analogy about pattern cutting and what people consider a pattern to be as a basic sort of premise for cutting the garment out. And most people would say, you know, it's a shape or, you know, a, a well, all sorts of other different things they might propose it is. But when you move into sort of 2D environments like computer screens, which plot everything as an X and Y coordinate system, and then you move pattern cutting into that system, it makes it clear that actually pattern cutting is this sort of relational XY system and points are plotted and lines drawn. And actually it moves it from this sort of creative shape, which I'm not saying it shouldn't necessarily be, to something which can be categorised clearly as an XY coordinate system. And then we move into body scanning and we've got this XYZ coordinate system. So what it allows us to do or brings forward is new perspectives that just reinforce what was there before, but allow us to view it in a different way and apply information in a different way. All right, um, so this is that quote I mentioned before. So it's from a book by somebody, uh, Simons, 1933. I can't remember what his first name is, but anyway, 1933 this book was written, all right, and it says, medical professions collected loads of data Parts of it are valuable guidance for designers, custom cutters and manufacturers. Most measurements, particularly the circumferences, are not taken at the same points of the body as measurements taken by cutters and tailors. It's 1933, the guy's basically saying, the information you're trying to provide me with from your surveys are not the information that I use to create the garments that we need to create. And this here, their circumference measurements are not taken at the points on the body where they can be used effectively in designing garments. That is still true today, and the idea of putting forward that, I think it's the ISO 7250 standard, as a means by which we should get all information from the body without recognising that the application of that measurement is hugely different in clothing manufacturing. I looked at another paper, again, early 2000s, on size chart development for New Zealand um, agricultural workers, and they've taken all these measurements, they're proposing a new categorisation for clothing size, and in amongst all these measurements is arm reach. Fantastic. So arm reach, they can reach a button on the inside of that cab, but it has absolutely no bearing on the product. Arm reach can't be applied to the development of a garment pattern. It has no context. So why would it occur you know, in the product development process, or why should it be there, you know, in the categorisation development size charts? There has to be a clear appreciation of the measurements that we're collecting. And again, I go back to the opportunities with body scanning is, I accidentally mismeasure somebody once, I can go back and say, you know what, that isn't the information I really need, that is. And I have the opportunity to take it again. So the, the capacity of this technology to allow us to evolve a better understanding through repeat analysis is there. Um, the role of ease in the block, I didn't think I'd get to the stage of showing this, but I'll just show it you briefly, it's nice and visual. Um, so you've got the front and back of a bodice, you've got that offset, the difference between the physical garment measurement and the physical body measurement, which is what ease is. And there are some of the parameters, although I'm a little bit more evolved. So function, comfort, style and other. Styling I would separate off because I say that's something that's often a, an independent decision of the designer that is going to influence it, but function, comfort, oversize, and I always forget one of them, fabric characteristics, are really the main contributors towards ease. And we go back to that idea of putting everything to a 3D system and a 2D system. It becomes numeric data, and therefore there's the opportunity for everything in the design process to be driven by numeric data. And that isn't to say everyone's practice must be numerically based, 
But if you're going to sit there and make adjustments to a garment and you're going to do it based upon some sort of heuristic understanding of previous practice, there is the opportunity later to categorise it numerically. And by doing so, you have the opportunity to inform people and structure things in the way they physically work, the garment and the body as 3D and 2D structures. And then that is the last slide. So Robin Etz one just saying, the more you try and standardise, the fewer people you fit. The more measurements of a population that you specify and try to satisfy, the fewer of that population you do satisfy. But let's imagine these are a pair of trousers. And you, oh, they, yeah, they don't have it. But if you were to take a, a full body garment, for instance, and say, well, look, if we just specify the chest girth, it fits 90% of the population, that's fantastic. But they have all the other measurements that garment covers. So there's huge difficulties with standardisation in terms of what it, what it obscures for creating garments that fit people. Okay, thank you.